Good morning and welcome to the morning service of Big Springs Community Church. Uh, we are kind of sparse today, maybe because of the weather or maybe some people uh, are under the weather. <laughs> um, I would like to direct you to the back of the sermon notes. And I have an article there, a short article about the International Theological Education Ministries. Uh, in short, it's an uh, item. So my recent trip to Riga in Latvia, in Eastern Europe, was organized and funded, uh, excluding Evelyn's, of course, only my expenses, by this organization called ITEM. And I taught a five-day modular class on the Book of Acts at a seminary called Baltic <coughs> Reform Theological Seminary. So I had uh, about five or six students in person and also about a dozen students on Zoom, online, uh, with an, in, a, a Russian interpreter because these people uh, came from different parts of Eastern Europe, uh, some as far as, far as uh, Siberia and uh, uh, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and places like that. So ITEM uh, assists denominations and local churches by sending uh, pastoral training, uh, sending pastors and uh, instructors and professors from seminaries in the US to local, to their local places so they don't have these pastors and leaders of the church. They don't have to come to the US for training and that, that causes you know, family hardship, uh, financial hardship also. So uh, some of the countries being served by ITEM include Bolivia, India, Indonesia, Kenya, Uganda, Lithuania, Romania, Ukraine, and of course, Latvia. Uh, so two years ago, uh, in March, um, I was supposed to be in Kyiv in Ukraine uh, doing the same thing, but of course uh, the war started, so uh, Ukraine is still closed at this time. So uh, ITEM <coughs> doesn't pay salaries to instructors, to the pastors who go there, uh, to those places. Instead, they only fund, finance the first trip of pastors. So my first trip this time, I was financed by item, but if <clears throat> I wanted to uh, teach in teach all again in, in in Riga in Latvia, maybe not during the winter. If if I wanted to teach there again, uh, you know, I would have to raise my own uh, support for my expenses there. So uh, at the bottom, if you would like to help. This worldwide ministry, uh, please send your tax deductible donation to, and there, there is an, um, an address, and there's also they have a website, and you can also uh, give them an email. Or if you want to, uh, you can um, um, send your check here uh, with, an, with a note uh, saying for item. So that is. That is my spiel on on uh, item, uh, which I found uh, find a very very uh, fruitful uh, a, a good organization. Okay, let us all stand for our call to worship. God assembles us and calls us to worship this morning with these words: On the holy mount stands the city He founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. So in the Old Testament, Mount Zion, uh, where the temple is in Jerusalem, was the city of God, the people of God. Uh, today, after Christ came, uh, the city of God is the church. So our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. God greets us this morning with this greeting. To the Church of God that is in Big Springs Community Church, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those 
who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us remain standing and, and sing number 87b, Zion founded on the mountains, 87b. As well today, uh, I will read one verse from 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new, new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. And so this flies in the face of uh, people who say that if we believe that uh, we do not lose our salvation, even if we do all kinds of disobedience and unfaithfulness against God's word, uh, we are still saved. But this is not correct because when we are truly saved, we are new creations. We are, we have new life in Christ. And so we do uh, good works in obedience to God's word because of our salvation. And the old nature has passed away, the new nature has already come to us. So let us pray together. Almighty God, we praise you and give you thanks with our whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Your wondrous works are full of splendor and majesty. When we look at your works in heaven by day or by night, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the galaxies. We know that you are the almighty and all-knowing creator. Most of all, we praise you for sending your redemption to us in your beloved son, Jesus Christ. May all your works of creation and redemption of your people strengthen our faith. Now we ask that your word and spirit enlighten our hearts that we may worship you today with reverence and joy. But our response to you, uh, your goodness and your providence is often not of praise and thanksgiving, but of ingratitude and apathy because of our sin. You have called us to holiness and uprightness, but we often fail in the blindness and rebellion of our hearts. So we ask you, O merciful Father, to cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength. Help us then by your Holy Spirit to lead sanctified lives 
in the midst of our sinful world. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for giving us this day and every first day of the week to gather your people together for worship and communion with you and one another. It reminds us that on the first day, you began your work of creation. On the first day of the week, your Son Jesus Christ, our Savior, rose from the grave. And also, on the first day of the week, you started pouring out the Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit upon all believers in the world. We give you thanks for all of these blessings you have given us. We pray for our church, Big Springs Community Church, that we may proclaim the gospel of Christ and call sinners to believe in him. But we pray not only for our church here, but also for your church worldwide, especially for those who are suffering from hunger and want, disease, war, and persecution. Give them peace and comfort. Strengthen their faith under these trials as you also strengthen ours. We pray for uh, that uh, your appointed civil government in this nation whom you have set over us may rule with justice, righteousness, and fairness. Give wisdom that come from you, even if they do not believe in you and your son, the King of Kings. Grant that under the rule and protection of the governing authorities, the preaching and teaching of the true gospel and the holy word of God may continue unhindered and protected. We pray that our nation's leaders will continue to uphold our freedoms, especially our freedoms of speech, assembly, and religion. We pray this morning especially for International Theological Education Ministries, uh, or ITEM, that you may prosper their work in training and equipping pastors, teachers, and other church leaders in many nations. Send pastors and teachers who are willing and able to do your work in places where there is less security and comfort that their own places here in our nation provide. Give them abundant fruit of their labors. Give your people here in our abundant hearts that are willing to enable item to accomplish your work faithfully. O merciful Lord, we um, pray that may it please you to heal the sick among us, surround them with your care and Bless all that is done to help them. Give their body and soul your comfort and your peace. We continue to pray for Leo, for uh, Cecilia, for B, for Helen Thompson, for Anita, and also for Pastor Bernie. Uh, we pray that uh, you may give them uh, comfort in their bodies and also in their souls. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God in glory everlasting, and who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our offerings today will be for the general fund and also for the building fund. Each one must give as he has decided 
in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us all stand for our thanksgiving hymn, How Blessed is He Who Trespass. Our scripture readings today will be a um, couple of verses from Exodus 19, and then we will go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So Exodus 19, beginning with verse 5, uh, this is uh, when the people of Israel were uh, summoned or assembled by God before Mount Sinai uh, for worship. The word of the Lord. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And then from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We will read a few verses. So the word of the Lord from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Dear congregation of Christ, our text says that the church in Corinth was made up of, uh, and I would quote again, the unrighteous, the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, and swindlers. So if I addressed you all as such, this church will be empty next Sunday. But Paul really describes people in the church. These are what kingdom people are not supposed to be and to do. Uh, not just actual visible sins, but sins of the heart. So the church is made up of people who are at the same time, uh, same time sinners and saints. And this is a great mystery. 
Think about this. In the very first verse of his first epistle to the Corinthians, which we read in our uh, greeting, he addresses them. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. They are saints. And then here in chapter 6, he calls them heinous sinners. So how can this be? Paul and the whole scriptures call all true and faithful believers in Christ saints. There are millions and millions of saints throughout Bible history and in all the earth. Not just the 2,000 or so people whom the Roman church calls saints. But Paul says, we were all like the Corinthians before we were saved. We were wretched sinners. And he says, and such were some of you. Where? In the past. Such were some of you. But Paul calls the church, God's people, not to be like the Corinthians. God's people are to be holy. Paul says we're different now. Although we are still sinners, we are also righteous in Christ. Because he said, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. All three verbs are passive, which means that all three actions were done by somebody else, someone else, not by us. For example, in political press conferences, and we hear this all the time, when a wrong decision is made by an administration, the press secretary will say, a mistake was made. A mistake was made. Passive. But who made the mistake? The secretary will not name names to avoid admission of guilt and to hide the erring officials. And since the three actions, washed, sanctified, justified, are all in the past tense, they are already done, finished. Also, note that all these three verbs go together. This means the true believers in the church have been totally changed. And who did the changing? The washing, the sanctifying, the justifying. It was all done by our Lord Jesus Christ in his perfect sinless life, his atoning death on the cross, and in his resurrection for our justification. So all three actions cannot be done separately. They are together. Believers cannot be justified without the washing away of sins. And believers cannot live sanctified or holy lives without being washed of their sins and declared justified and righteous by God. Therefore, this morning, as we continue our series on the doctrine of the church in the Apostles' Creed, our theme is wash, sanctified, justified. In the Apostles' Creed, we say we believe in the holy, catholic, and apostolic, uh, in the one holy catholic church and also in the nicene creed we believe in the holy catholic and apostolic church so we will study these three words washed sanctified justified in more detail under three headings so first of all you were washed so to wash away dirt and filth totally to make something clean so our sinfulness is to the core of our being. But the Corinthians were totally washed clean. Is Paul talking about water baptism? Yes and no. Water baptism is the outward sign of the washing away of sins. But the word here used is not the usual word for baptism. Paul means to say here that the Corinthians were cleansed from sin by the Holy Spirit's work of regeneration, his work of uh, being, of making people 
of being born again in the spirit. So this is to be morally and spiritually cleansed. So we we uh, read, for example, in Psalm fifty one seven, an example. Uh, David asking forgiveness from God. He says, he prays, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. In the Old Testament, water symbolizes spiritual cleansing, the cleansing of the heart and mind, cleansing from the filth of sin. So at Mount Sinai, God commanded the people to, to wash themselves and their garments before they can come before God. Before priests go into the tabernacle or temple to offer sacrifices, they must wash themselves clean with water. Listen to Ezekiel 36, 25, where the Lord promises his people. He says, I will sprinkle water, uh, clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. So does the water of purification in the Old Testament really has the power to cleanse God's people of the uncleannesses of their sins? No, for this cleansing water is only a foretaste or a shadow of the atoning blood of Christ. So 1 John 1, 7, we read, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is why Jesus used water from the jars of ceremonial washing during the wedding at Cana. He was demonstrating to the Jews that the old covenant purification rites by water are becoming obsolete since he was about to cleanse his people from all sins through his sacrifice, not through ceremonial washing. So then, when are we washed clean of our sins? When we were born again, or regenerated, converted, given new hearts and minds by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit gave us the gift of faith and repentance through the saving work of Christ on the cross, so in Titus 3, 5, Paul says, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So Hebrews 10, verse 22 affirms this cleansing, thereby encouraging us to draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean, from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. So that is the symbolism of water cleansing by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, salvation from sin is only through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit symbolized by water. As members of Christ's church, we were, you were washed clean by the Holy Spirit. And also, you were sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So that's our next uh, point. You were sanctified. So in this list, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. A Christian who knows his doctrines will probably get confused. So is Paul saying that sanctification comes before justification and sanctification is also in the past tense. So we all know that sanctification, the process of making us holy and into the image of Christ is a lifelong process. So how can it be passed? And how come it, is, it comes before justification? Justification first is and then we are sanctified. Uh, we live holy lives because we have been saved. We have been justified by God. So, isn't this backwards? But Paul here, his focus is on sanctification, living holy lives. 
not just justification. So sanctification has two meanings. The first meaning is being set apart by God for his purpose. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the temple, the Holy of Holies, the utensils, the Sabbath, and the high priest are all common. But all these things and these high priests are holy to the Lord because they had been set apart by God for his holy use. God sets himself apart as the only perfectly holy being. He is like no other. Thus, everything that belongs to him also has to be holy or set apart from the rest. So, for example, we will have Lord's Supper this morning. <coughs> and in the Lord's Supper, we use, you know, common bread and, and uh, juice or wine in many other churches. And these are common only. We buy them from the grocery store. But when we use them for this holy communion, then it becomes holy. It is consecrated for the holy use of God. <coughs> Israel was set apart by God from the rest of the nations as his treasured possession among all peoples, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They were the only nation like that. All the rest of the earth uh, were not set apart by God. They, God left them as, as just common, common nations. This was repeated by Peter when he calls the church a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. 1 Peter 2.9 And so the church is holy, made up of believers who had been set apart by God from the rest of humanity the moment they believed in Christ. There is also a sense that this setting apart was made from eternity past when he chose us to be saved by his son Jesus Christ, our Lord. But when does this setting apart by God happen in our lives? At the moment of our washing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. When we were born from above and given faith, faith and repentance. At that moment, God makes us citizens of his holy nation, of his set apart nation. He sets us apart from the rest of the nations, the unbelieving world. So that is the first meaning. The second meaning of sanctification is the process of holiness in our lives. And so God commands us, be holy for I am holy. As the people of God, we are to be holy and to show others our holiness. But this lifelong process is a sure thing because God has promised that he will complete the work that he had begun in us. Philippians 1, 6. Therefore, sanctification is already a done deal, even if it is still in process because of God's sure promise. And as the people of God, do you show yourselves as sanctified people by your behavior and your works? Do you proclaim God's excellencies to the world, to your families and friends? Do you let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify God the Father in heaven? Or by your disunity in the church, strife, jealousy, face of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy? Is the name of God blasphemed among unbelievers? It is tragic that survey after survey among American evangelicals 
conclude that there is no difference in the lifestyles of Christians and non-Christians. Divorce is actually more common among Christians than non-Christians. More church-going unwed mothers go to the pregnancy centers than others. God washed you of filthiness of your sins. He also sanctified you by setting you apart from unbelievers and giving you his spirit to give you strength to live holy lives. And thirdly and lastly, you were justified. Justification is a long theological word. Many Christians are turned off by long theological words like justification and sanctification. This is another sign of biblical illiteracy among evangelicals. In a 2001 Barna survey, only about 60% of conservative American evangelicals believe that a person cannot be saved or justified by works. And so 40%, that's a huge number, 40% of American evangelicals believe that a person can be saved by good works. Many Christians don't even know what this word means. The most common answer to the question, what is justification, would probably be, it is salvation. Yet, justification is not just a generic term for salvation. It is a courtroom or a forensic term, meaning to declare a person innocent of the charges against him. Justification is when a sinner is declared righteous by God because the righteousness of Christ is counted as his own righteousness. Just like when a defendant in court is declared not guilty. So justification is twofold. Question 60 of the Heidelberg Catechism summarizes these two aspects of justification. So the first aspect is a person is declared righteous and it says as if he had never sinned nor been a sinner. As if he had never sinned or been a sinner. So the perfect righteousness of Christ is put into his account. So that is the first aspect of justification. The second aspect of justification is he is righteous and it says as if he had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for him. As if he had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for him. So Christ's perfect obedience, his sinless life, is also put into his account as if he himself had done all of Christ's perfect obedience. And that is what will happen when we go before God and Christ on Judgment Day. When he sees us, right next to us is our Lord Jesus Christ. And he will not see any of our sins that we have performed or done in this life. He will only see, God will only see the perfect, sinless, good works of our Lord Jesus Christ in us. So some surveys also found that 30% of American evan uh, evangelicals believe that they have some sins which gonna, uh, God cannot forgive. So this is not what justification is all about. Justification is when God pardons all all of the person's sins and counts all of Christ's obedience to that person's account. All his sins are erased completely and permanently from his account. <coughs> How can God do this? Only on account of the work of Christ on the cross. 
So question 60 of the Heidelberg Catechism asks, How are we righteous before God? And the answer is, only by true faith in Jesus Christ. There is no work we can do to earn heaven. And this is what the Protestant reformers fought against the Roman church. No prayers, no indulgences, no giving to the poor, no good works can save a person. Why? Because the Bible says that even one sin would earn us a ticket to hell. And the Bible also says that we are all sinners. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you were justified only by true faith alone in Christ alone. <coughs> Excuse me. So, beloved people of God, you, Paul says, were once children of wrath, unholy and unrighteous before God. But because of the work of Christ, you were washed of your sins. You were sanctified, set apart as God's treasured possession and holy nation for good works. You were justified by faith alone in the finished work of Christ. Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer 86, gives us several reasons why you should live holy, sanctified lives <coughs> as individuals and as a holy church. So, uh, one reason, the first reason is, so you may not go back to your old unholy ways, since the Spirit... <coughs> is renewing us into Christ's image. Paul reminds us of our checkered past. He says, such were some of you. Such were some of you. But not anymore. Second, your holy lives are your thanksgiving to God for all the blessings of salvation he has given you. Your good works are your sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving to Him. The third reason is, through your good works, God is praised by others also. And finally, your holy lives are your witness to your neighbors, so that they too will believe in Christ. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of this holy feast. Although we are unworthy to share this meal with you, it is only by your invitation and dressed in Christ's righteousness that we have come boldly into the Holy of Holies. Instead of wrath, we have received your pardon. In the place of fear, we have been given hope. Our High Priest and Mediator of the New Covenant has reconciled us to you and even now intercedes for us at your right hand. Please strengthen us by these gifts, so that relying only on your promise to save sinners who call on Jesus' name, we may by your Spirit honor you with our souls and bodies to the honor and glory of your holy name. O Lord, we praise and thank you also for your assurances that although we are sinners, we are also saints, set apart for holy living and for obedience to your word. We praise your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, for his incomprehensible love for us, his people, his church, in his humble incarnation, life and death on the cross for our justification. And in his name we pray. Amen. To all of you who have with godly sorrow confessed your sins and who have firm true faith in Christ, the promise of Jesus is sure. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. 
For the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So while remaining bread and wine, these sacred elements nevertheless become so united to the reality they signify that we do not doubt but joyfully believe that we receive in this meal by the Spirit through faith nothing less than the crucified body and shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. For all who live in rebellion against God and in unbelief, this holy food and drink will bring you only further condemnation. If you do not yet confess Jesus Christ and seek to live under his gracious reign, we admonish you to abstain. But all who repent and believe are invited to this sacred meal, not because you are worthy in yourself, but because you are clothed in Christ's perfect righteousness. Do not allow the weakness of your faith or your failures in the Christian life to keep you from this table, for it is given to us because of our weakness and because of our failures in order to increase our faith by feeding us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. As the word has promised us God's favor, so also our Heavenly Father has added this confirmation of his unchangeable promise. And so come, believing sinners, for the table is ready. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who by the blood of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, has secured for us a new and living way into the Holy of Holies, cleanse our minds and hearts by your word and spirit, that we, your redeemed people, drawing close to you through this holy sacrament, may enjoy fellowship with the Holy Trinity through the body and blood of Christ our Savior. We know that our ascended Savior does not live in temples made by hands, but is in heaven, where he continues to intercede on our behalf. Through this sacrament, by your own word and spirit, may these common elements now be set apart from ordinary use and consecrated by you, so that just as truly as we eat and drink these elements by which our bodily life is sustained, so truly we receive into our souls, for our spiritual life, the true body and true blood of Christ. We receive these gifts by faith, which is the hand and mouth of our souls. Amen. As we draw near to the table of our Lord, let us confess our Christian faith. So, um, on the overhead. Um, so, okay, let us uh, confess our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now go to our heavenly table and receive the gift of God for our souls. By the promise of God, this bread and wine is for us the body and blood of Christ. Lift up your hearts.
The bread that we break is a communion of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Take, eat, remember, and believe the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken for a complete forgiveness of all our sins. The cup of blessing which we bless is a communion of the blood of Christ. Take, drink, remember, and believe 
that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for a complete forgiveness of all our sins. Thank you.